Um, thanks um, everyone for coming along tonight. Um, this is the latest in our kind of series of events that we've been having um, sort of more informal discussions over the past few weeks about the kind of post COVID and what we might be seeing as we fingers crossed are starting to come out of lockdown here in the UK at least. Um, we've got a really interesting topic tonight, um, the kind of the future of working, and we've called it the future of working. It's probably more than just the kind of the future of the office, although we'll certainly be talking about that. Um, for those of you that were on the, um, or joined us for the video um, uh, film night event back in January, um, we had a bit of discussion after that around kind of what the post-COVID world was going to look like in terms of working and sort of more broadly what that would mean for our towns and cities in terms of where people would work, how they choose to work, um, and kind of what impacts we'd seen as a result of COVID and what we felt might change back again or what might stay changed forever. Um, and we kind of decided at the end of that it was probably a topic worth covering in a bit more detail, hence we're here today. So first of all, um, thank you to the um, four speakers that we've got um, joining us tonight. Um, We'll be starting with John Avery from LOM Architecture and Design, who's going to be talking a bit about um, some work and research they've been doing, looking at what the um, office might look like um, in the post-COVID world. Um, Andy Graham will then be talking to us a bit about um, co-working spaces and different kinds of workspaces, um, and in particular how that could be beneficial for kind of um, preserving heritage um, buildings in the community. Um, then pleased to say Alex Cochran's joining us from all the way from Sweden um, to talk a bit about sort of some lessons from there and also what the future of work might mean for the high street, which is obviously a very hot topic. Um, and then finally, we'll end with um, Derma talking a bit about um, towns and distributed working um, sort of rhetoric and reality of some of those topics. Um, and hopefully we'll be sort of wrapping that up in around about an hour's time and that will leave half an hour or so at the end for some discussion because actually I think one of the key parts of tonight will be the discussion with all of you here. Um, you're more than welcome to put comments, thoughts about what you're hearing and what people are saying in the chat as we go. Um, if you've got a specific question, um, raise your hand or put it in the, the chat bar and we'll keep an eye on those. Um, and then once the four speakers have finished, we'll kind of start to work through um, some of those. Um, before we do start, I just ask the normal kind of housekeeping. Everyone knows it by now. We're probably um, can use Zoom in our sleep. But if you could stay muted, um, if you want to keep your camera on or off, entirely up to you. Um, and then if you want to ask a question, um, either if you put it in the chat, um, I'm happy to read it out or alternatively, if you'd like to ask it in person or make a comment in person, just put your hand up and I can um, come to you. And if you want to put your camera on, that'll be great. Um, so everyone can see you. If not, feel free just to, to ask the question. So um, without further ado, I will hand over to John um, to give his short presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. I will share my screen with just a couple of slides. So if you can't see it or something looks wrong, please shout. There we go. I'll go full screen. Um, so um, yeah, so our, our perspective is, is you know, through the pandemic has been very much uh, working for end users, occupiers. Um, this is a photo from probably last April. Um, this is 1,000 office chairs are waiting to be shipped out from one of our clients' head office buildings out to their staff working at home. And uh, I thought it was it was quite a striking image a year ago that captured the scale of the change. And, and what, um, what a lot of people sort of quickly realised was that that 1,000 office chairs is never going to come back in to the office. It's gone. People are using them at home. They're quite happy. And, and you know, uh, that, that obviously has quite major implications. Some of the people we've been working with over the past year, um, sort of mainly in the financial um, tech sector um, and the energy sector. I haven't put on here, but Microsoft actually are a big client of ours as well. And, and all of them have been through the same sort of process of thinking. First of all, there was the immediate reaction about, um, you know, making offices safe, setting up for social distancing, supporting home working. There was a bit of a period of thinking about a new kind of office that was quite exciting. Um, then there was a period, probably sort of last autumn, where people were, were starting to ask themselves whether they even needed as many buildings. Um, and and uh, then there was a period when they expected everyone to come back. So 
you know, there was there was a moment when I think we we perhaps got a bit overexcited by vaccines, thought things would be back to normal in January. So there was a lot of rapid change. And, and now I can think this latest lockdown has given everyone the opportunity to really start thinking about the longer term. Um, so a couple of examples, I suppose, at different scales of the sort of work we've been doing. This is a, a sort of tactical um, piece of work. So, you know, a client who's thinking about how do I, you know, I've, I've got office buildings full of desks and I'm uh, expecting, uh, you know, fewer people to, to be using them in future. How do I respond to that? So, you know, we, we've been doing a lot of this kind of thing where desks are taken out, spaces are switched up, they're made more flexible. And, and I think really importantly, they're made more rich in terms of functionality. So a greater range of activities supported and the idea of more collaborative space, more flexible space within the traditional office building. And, you know, in some cases that's being done in a zone or a floor. Um, th this is a, a vision that we've, Sort of develop with with one of our clients which is you know more on a building level so <clears throat> the idea of re rethinking the whole building moving from the traditional office to the idea of a, a collaboration hub with a, a real focus on hospitality and um, making a great experience for visitors and for and for staff and i think really importantly uh, on on a bigger scale this idea of a wider mix of uses so you know this building would have you know at least two different uh, catering areas, a cafe, a restaurant. It would have um, great hospitality spaces, sort of hotel style event um, and meeting areas, co-working space. Um, you know, potentially in some areas, it might even have space for staff to stay over, you know, roof terraces, gyms, all those kind of things, um, which, which, you know, in a way start to create the idea of a, a sort of city within a building. Um, and, you, you, you know, part of the sort of implication of that is the idea of cha changing the meaning of the office a bit. I, we, we do a lot of work with that West on the left hand side, their current head office at the top of Bishop's Gate. And I've always been really interested in their original head office, which is the National Provincial Bank um, building at the bottom end of Bishop's Gate. It's now called the Gibson Hall and it's it's used as an event space. And, and, and I've always thought that, you know, it was a wonderful example of, of you know, that that sort of idea of the, the 19th, 30, 20th century head office as, 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 a, as a sort of symbolic urban space, you know, quite public with a huge banking hall and the kind of work aspect of it being, being secondary. And I think that's perhaps what, what sort of big city office buildings are going to start to move towards. Um, a couple of projects we've finished in, in the last sort of couple of years and are working on, I think, tie into this theme. So, um, this one here was a project for Tesco at their campus um, up, up in Hertfordshire. So creating a new building on, on um, what used to be a car park in the centre of a campus. And the idea of creating a heart to the campus and a social hub. Uh, this was an interesting building because at the time it was, um, uh, people found it a bit hard to categorise. And, you know, even when we were entering it for awards and that sort of thing, the, the question was asked, well, you know, is it really a workplace building? Because actually... There's very little desk space in it. It's got, you know, touchdown collaboration space. There's a shop, there's test kitchens, uh, there's a gym, there's an event space. Um, it's not somewhere you sit at a desk all day, but of course now, you know, that's what the, you know, we are starting to think of, of, of the future office being. And, and importantly, it, it has a symbolism. So it's now the place where if you're, if you work for Tesco and you're going to visit their head office, um, you, this is the building you come to because it's because it hosts all those visitors from around the country. Um, you know, it, it, it had a whole landscaping piece that went with it that, to enrich the site. Uh, and you can see the mix of functions, you know, events, um, retail, social all in one space. Um, the event space on the right hand side, the test kitchens where they develop all the delicious ready meals that we've all been eating a lot more of this year. Um, so that's a building that we finished last year that I think ties into this theme. And, and one that we're working on now that's on site is Santander Digital Hub. This is in Milton Keynes. Again, this is on a car park site. So this view would be looking roughly from uh, the station in Milton Keynes across the plaza. Um, and Santander's existing office is behind this. So we're building a new building that's, again, you know, a bit of a city in a building. So the the whole ground floor of this building is is pretty much public. Um, it's got um, uh, you know restaurant, retail, gym, nursery, 
activities and we've designed the ground floor quite carefully so that it is permeable people can walk through it and it's linked through with um, uh, this sort of improved underpass through to the station and then onto the city um, and and so it you know it builds on a lot of those themes you've been seeing in co-working with the the, the, the sort of food hall market type space on the ground floor. Um, you know, the idea of mixing up circulation and event presentation spaces to, to create more of an experience. Uh, and then, you know, the, the rooftop running track, inevitably the health and well-being and, and the roof terrace um, linked to a sort of rooftop cafe space. Um, and, you know, th this has been an interesting building in, in so far as it's, it's on site now, it's just coming out of the ground. And you know, as it's coming up, we're already in the process of rethinking how it's going to work, making it even more flexible and even more sort of engaging, I, I think, as, as an experience. So a few thoughts to sum up. First of all, you know, what's happening? Hybrid working is definitely happy, happening. You know, I know there's one or two businesses who've said we want everyone back, but everyone that we work for is, is looking at, you know, on average, you know, three days in the office, two days at home. You know, segmenting staff, some will be in no days a week, some will be in five days a week. Virtually everyone we're working for is reducing space and it's all about better space. So moving out of lower quality buildings into smaller buildings that are better quality, perhaps more characterful as well and more centrally located. Um, the idea of a wider range of functions and, and, you know, obviously the question of what fills the gap in, in the urban context. If every you know, major businesses reducing their space by 40%, you know, what, what does that mean? You know, it, it could mean that the city of London, you know, sees a wave of, of, you know, startup companies that couldn't previously afford city space moving in, which I think would be fantastic. There may be some, you know, some conversion to resi. And I think one of the important questions that, that people are starting to think about, and we, we've been talking about on the um, NLA, um, work panel this year is, is how does this future office support the urban economy? Because I think one of the dangers of creating a city in a building is, you know, if, if you're replicating all those functions, you don't need to engage with the, the streets around you. And I think it's really important that, that occupiers do draw on, um, you know, the city that they're in. And I've highlighted the, the last word there is food, because I don't know about anyone else, but one of the things I'm really missing about the office is getting into town, you know, eating Shoreditch street food, going out to lunch, and and I think it's you know I, I think um, in 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 the future office, you know, people don't want to go in and eat from a staff canteen. So how can occupiers, you know, bring you know the the best of that urban economy into their space, and make the office experience an urban experience, as well as making the city around them, you know, continue to benefit from from. Um, from the activity of work that I'm sure will continue to happen in city centres, um, you know, for as long as for as long as they're around. So that's all from me. Thanks, everyone. That's great. Thank you very much for that, um, John. That's really interesting start. Um, so over to Andy next, I think. Hello there. Um, <laughs> I must apologise because mine's a bit of a monologue, I'm afraid, uh, because I've got a three week old baby uh, who's been and a cat who's been keeping me up all night. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so unfortunately, I don't have any slides to share, um, but I wanted to um, just explain that, you, you know, remote working for a lot of people isn't a new thing. Um, we in the urban globe have been a micro business for, for a long time um, and and. Um, a few years ago, a good few years ago now, um, Design Council Cave had a lovely slide in one of their presentations saying work is something you do, not somewhere you go. And that's kind of been one of my mantras. I'm sure it's been a lot of people's mantra here, really, um, that actually you don't necessarily need to be in a place. And one of the challenges for cities um, going back a, a, a long way, I remember doing some master planning in Leeds and I said to the chief planner, I said, look, People have the whole world or the whole country to decide where they want to live and work. They don't have to be here. So what makes your place so special? And I, I looked at them and they just gave me blank, blank expressions back. But there's certainly something in that, especially now. People now have suddenly cottoned on to the idea that actually I don't need to go in, into the office um, I can, I can obviously, you know, you, 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 we've proven that this can happen. So the next step is 
how do we manage it and and you know we're asking ourselves the questions yes this ideal is okay but is it actually an ideal in my experience working remotely um can be a very lonely experience and i'm sure a lot of a lot of us here have probably felt that over lockdown. In fact, lockdown has been, been a godsend for me in some ways because I've actually had company and everybody's in the same boat, you know. Um, my, my working day um, before lockdown was generally going into town, uh, uh, cycling into, into, into Leeds, that's where I am, um, for around half nine, going to, a, going to a cafe, having a couple of coffees, checking my emails, and then going to a, a, a library that I'm a, a member of um, which is a bit like the London Library and doing some research there and looking at really ancient books, you know, but I, I very much missed talking to people, very much missed talking to people about the planning act and silly things like this. Um, and I dabbled with co-working spaces um, and I went to co-working spaces because I wanted to, I wanted to talk to people, <laughs> you know, I wanted to be, I wanted to get in a, one of these creative, funky little places and just bounce ideas around. And I'm sure that could happen, but you go to these places and, well, basically everybody's there to work. So I'm sat there behind a desk paying £20 a day or £30 a day, whatever it was, um, to sit on the desk and not talk to anybody. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, um, it, it was a bizarre situation. And I thought, well, I could be I could be elsewhere doing this. Um, but now, of course, there's a real opportunity here. I think we all recognize, you know, we, we all recognize that that nobody's going to be going to work five days a week ever again. However, we also recognize that there are a lot of people who who really value um connections and creative thinking and get togethers this will happen this is why cities won't die because we we need this and and they will be the melting pots but they'll be the melting pots of creativity in different ways i believe um and one idea we we dabbled with quite a while ago was um during the austerity measures when a lot of public libraries and public buildings were being sold off um and closed down I'm actually thinking, well, these public buildings could still serve a public good in terms of creating these co-working spaces that potentially we all may need. And now we do need them. So, you know, my vision is to is to is to reprovision some of these public libraries. Maybe it's a Carnegie library. So that's what they were born from um, and, and possibly town halls and make sure that these icons of our communities, of our high streets, real heritage assets a lot of the time make sure that they are used and and um and able to be to serve that community function again you know people won't be going into their main office all the time but they may just want to get away for a couple of hours and go down the road in their community in their in their you know we've heard about the the renaissance of the suburb almost in lockdown haven't we um and and this is a this is a prime a prime way in which which some of these buildings could be could be used and reprovided for um so i think that's my that's my little take really and i, I apologize I, I i hate myself for not having any slides on this um but just remember you know work is something we do not somewhere we go and we we have an opportunity now to actually live and work wherever we want and the challenge for cities is to make those places where we want to go we don't have to be there anymore so why why would we want to be there i think that's <laughs> forgive me john um forgive me right. <laughs> <laughs> no i think i mean i think it's um it's really fascinating to get your kind of your personal perspective as well as your professional perspective I suppose to a certain degree which is um fantastic I'm sure there's lots of things in what you said that other people will recognize and that we can um pick up on in the discussion in a while so um no thanks very much for that Andy um right with that I will pass over to Alex if you want to go next thank you uh yes thanks Paul and thanks Andy don't feel at all bad about not having slides it was a lovely little narrative you just gave it. I really enjoyed it. Um, I've got some slides, but they're hideously ugly. So uh, apologies for that. Um, I'm going to try and uh, share my screen here, conquer the technical challenges. Somebody shout if that's not being seen. Yeah, 
see that. Thanks. Okay. Uh, yeah, so uh, that's me, uh, work at Sueco. I'm also teaching uh, these days at Malmö University and uh, the European Commission on Sustainable Cities. And it's this topic is something we're talking about quite a lot, actually. Um, so I've got 10 slides here. Um, Alex, it's Jacqueline from the UDG. I'm just wondering, yeah. you just shared your PowerPoint or your PDF? PDF, I think. Um, okay, yeah. we're just having pro Is anybody else having problems seeing Alex's slides? Yes. Uh, it's jumping. Yeah. It's not. It's not visible. Yeah, that black line glitch is back again. Unfortunately. Would you just double check? This is this is the, this is the PDF. Yeah, it is the PDF. Okay. Yeah, that's strange. It was working before, wasn't it? It was working before. Is, is that better when it's not full screen? Possibly. Would um maybe it's a bandwidth thing. Would everybody just for um. Alex's presentation, perhaps just turn their cameras off. It may not help at all, but it be an odd thing. <laughs> if not, I can just talk. As I said, they're pretty ugly. I <laughs> um, wonder if it's better if it's not on the full screen thing. I think it's probably some, something to do with the video adapter um, or, or the, the graphics display on your computer. Just, just pers persevere with what you've got. Um, okay. I think we can deal with a black line, no problem. We've, yeah, okay. we've done good words. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, so what I was going to talk about anyway was um, I, I did a sort of a little study for a Swedish house, housing developer a few years ago on this, sort of obliquely on this topic. And um, so I thought it would be interesting just to go through the, what our findings were on that. And, and because some, some of the conclusions were to do with kind of public space and communities and things. But also because we've been in a bit of a unique situation here in Sweden uh, in the sense that uh, we've been kind of in a lockdown but the communities around us have been open and functioning we haven't had any restrictions really um, other than sort of being sensible on um, on using you know the, the communities around us the commercial services and stuff and for me I think it's been a bit of an incubator for some of these things we've talking about we're talking about so this assignment I did back in 2016, I know the world's gone completely bananas since 2016, but it wasn't that long ago. Um, Swedish house builder, and, and I was working with three organizations here in Sweden um, uh, uh, to sort of get the, the sort of evidence together on, on future trends and, and stuff like that. Hyper Island, which uh, looks at, um, it, it's, a, it's a business university, uh, online, but it also looks at working trends and business trends. Uh, Bullverket, which is the Swedish House Builders Association, they've done predict predictions on how sort of urban living is is going to be in the future. And the Copenhagen Institute for Future Studies, which does what it says on the tin, really. Um, and the brief was how how will current living and working trends influence compactness? So it was all about leveraging these societal trends uh, to achieve sort of higher densities in cities. And the most striking thing we had to get our heads around was um, the fourth industrial revolution automation, um, which to some is, is utopia and to others is a dystopia. Um, if, you, if you believe the World Economic Forum, for example, it's, it's, it's tremendously good news. It's, it's gonna mean, uh, much more productivity, liberation from offices, green cities, and so on. We're all going to be working in the knowledge economy and upskilling, uh, lots of innovation, lots of time with our families, uh, time to spend on ourselves, health and wellness and personal fulfillment. Um, but of course, there are very pessimistic predictions too, that it's actually going to just lead to complete stagnation, no jobs, no incentive to invest in the technology at all concentration of wealth and a kind of uh, uh, yeah apocalyptic future but i think our sort of conclusion when we did the study anyway was that basically automation is is really quite a positive uh, thing and it's going to be it's going to sort of leverage a kind of uplift in livability if we handle it correctly as a as a society and as a sort of an, uh, an urban community. And then the other things um, 
which were clear from that study was that the knowledge economy is is growing at the accelerating rate uh, we're moving into a very agile business culture in terms of time and space um, we're able to work increasingly where we want um, and when we want and mix it with our lifestyles sustainability is an increasingly important value proposition for businesses and that's now linked to for example green finance behind developments uh, much more clearly as well um, and in, uh, shared and circular economies are being integrated much more with business culture um, the work-life balance we've talked about collaboration is such a core competence now in in working life and and that's very connected with our agile working culture um, we rely very heavily these days on the network society and um and our, uh, the, the necessity to have this sort of hybrid knowledge where we have to be sort of specialists and generalists all at the same time i think this is very familiar to the people who are interested in the urban design group but it's 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 a business trend uh, across the board um and co-creation and um other themes particularly social enterprise and social entrepreneurship are becoming increasingly important so that was all back in 2016 and obviously a lot of those trends are very real to us now um but there was one sort of interesting conclusion that we drew from that uh for our um our client our house builder client and that was that the more we immerse ourselves in this sort of digital working environment the more demand is clearly created for two things strong strong communities around us and quality public space and and that's really because the only way we can leverage all these op opportunities is by interacting with with people um and this is something andy was just pointing out very clearly you know this this uh you know to to to, to get the most out of out of this this network society or the all these opportunities we find from digital working and agile working and stuff we need human contact we are social animals and this is where anthropology plays a big role um uh the, the other sort of trends were as were, were that home would become the base and and the office would become a kind of on-demand resource and our relationship to the office would begin to change very clearly um, and that business support services within the sort of active travel catchment of your home your walking and cycling distance from your home they will be more in demand in the future um, and there are other important things that fed into that the way that livable cities for example is are becoming you know a competitive positioning factor for cities in themselves and that's sort of giving another sort of context to all these uh, changes to to do with you know creating better environments for working in we don't need to introduce that guy um and so as i said we've been in a bit of a unique situation here we if i can put it in a nutshell we've been sort of stuck at home by yeah our employers have basically said stay home but basically the community around our homes has stayed open and and it seems to me that this is provided or this is my observation just my sort of reflection on life here in the past year is it, it's been something of an incubator for some of these trends and it's accelerated some of these trends um and with the with the um effect that it's kind of leveraged some quite noticeable benefits to local communities um which are in a lot of ways are just as sort of you know green around the gills and and sad looking as as anywhere else um so um agile working for example is definitely seen as preferable to be at home when you can choose to be at home but in fact what's really noticeable is that people are demanding co-working and co-creation spaces close to home um that's clearly happening um also people are and people i know for, literally in my neighborhood are, are developing sort of a completely different kind of portfolio career so they're having a knowledge-based job but they're also developing an artisan job two examples there's a guy who lives close to me who's just started fixing bikes two days a week and another guy who cycles around on a cargo bike uh, sharpening knives 
Uh, in fact, I, saw, I just saw him this evening. Um, and people, that, that that's starting to happen. Um, uh, they, socializing during the day, during lunchtime is a very big deal in Sweden. People tend to do that rather than do it in the evening. And the, all that trade has started to noticeably shift to local communities and local high streets. Um, there's a big focus on fitness and outdoors and socializing around health and fitness and this kind of work-life balance. And everyone knows this is a very sort of quite highly respected thing in Sweden already. Um, but that's become even more significant in people's lives when we have the choice. Again, it, I think it's something everybody's experienced a bit that to be forced to try and mix your your family life and your work is, is incredibly stressful uh, when you can't when you choose to do it, it's very convenient. But when uh, you when you don't have the choice, it's pretty stressful. But of course, our city centres have suffered as a result of this. And we miss our colleagues and our, the creative energy they give. So uh, for me, just observing that, I think that some of these trends are really good news for local centres and high streets. I think they have a very positive future if these trends are leveraged in the right way. And that will mean you know, the right kind of planning, um, the right kind of uh, decision making. And I, as a sort of dodgy prediction, I, I wonder if we're going to see a lot of pop ups and meanwhile uses and sort of informal kind of things like this starting to happen in high streets when we start to emerge from the COVID experience, um, just to sort of test the water and test the market for these kinds of things in high streets. Um, and local communities. I'm really interested in what anyone thinks um, about that. Just, I don't know if I've still got time, I haven't been keeping an eye, but just a very quick um, thing. I'm working at the moment with a, a pilot project in Ghana, um, which sounds a bit off, off topic, but it, I don't think it is. It's a sort of um, uh, business center for young people uh, in regional areas in, in Ghana. Um, so it's a sort of prefabricated uh, building that contains sort of business, it's like a business hub, a learning center, a community center, an entertainment hub. It's sort of everything packaged into one that can be put out in, in villages, out um, in regions. The idea is that we're sort of taking the opportunities to, to the villages. And I wonder if, um, and it's leveraging a lot of these sort of trends and digitalized opportunities of digitalization and I wonder if there's something in that that we can learn from in terms of sort of stimu sort of channeling some of this some of these synergies into our high streets and getting getting a sort of local cycle of wealth creation happening again in in some of those areas that's all for me thanks very much great thank you very much Alex that was really um interesting I think there was lots of um ideas and points and thoughts to stimulate debate in that lot um and look again i'm sure i'm sure a lot of the people on the um the call will have their own thoughts and agree with you or disagree with you um on some of those so it'll be good to to talk about that more later um so what i'll do now is i'll ask um Dermot is our last speaker if he can um give his short presentation um and then we've got plenty of time to um, have some discussion and um, amongst everyone else. So again, if you've got any questions or comments, please do put them in the chat or raise your hands um, and we'll, we'll have a bit of a discussion in a short while. Over to you, Dermot, thanks. Thanks, Paul. And thanks everyone uh, for the opportunity to, to be here. Um, so I'm, I'm Dermot uh, and I, I'm based in Scotland. Uh, I'm from Ireland, from a very small place in Ireland, and I've moved to Scotland a number of years ago. And now I work for the Scottish Futures Trust, who is an arm's length company of Scottish government looking at the future of infrastructure. And one of my core uh, areas of focus is not cities, it's the urbanism of small places. And I guess uh, in the urbanism of small places, there's kind of two, two big decisions, really. Um, one is, are you there by circumstance? or the second is, are you there by choice? And, and looking at the, the COVID trends and the distributed work and then the romance of the potential of small places, I think we need to kind of challenge that about the reality of why people are in small places, what it does and what it doesn't offer, and then uh, kind of moving through some of the choice. But so I guess the presentation wants to look at three things. The first one is, 
um, in terms of any location, why here? Second is when we're in a location, what is it that people need? So we've talked about the home and the reconfiguration of the office, but not everyone works in the office and not everyone works in that way of working. So what are the kind of the settings of work, um, physical work, uh, local work? And then the third bit is it's not just about the job, you know, so lots of people move to rural places for a job, but then the family don't have things to do. So there's a social context and a supportive context of work. The image is Larwick. Larwick is, is in the Shetlands. It's a stunning, stunning place. Uh, when you arrive in, in Shetlands into Sunbridge, you get the airport uh, express. It's a taxi with a guy uh, playing country and Western music for about half an hour all the way into the center at Larwick. And you arrive in this stunningly beautiful place, which is a creation of the sea, uh, as described by a man called William C. Wonders, an American geographer who came over and looked at it. And, it, and it's a, a creation of the sea because it's folded into the landscape and the high street of Larry kind of bends and twists and moves. And to the left of the high street are a series of mini canals that project into the sea called Lodbury's. And when the sea goes out, the Lodbury's opened up and it's a hard surface area to repair your boat, repair your, your car, repair whatever it is. And then when the, the sea comes in, your boat comes literally to the door of your kitchen and you can offload your fish and have a great uh, food in the evening. Fantastic. Um, it's also an offshore base for the oil industry. So huge amounts of people work here, not from Shetland, not from Larwick. And their core purpose every month is to go to this place and occupy the place and then go out onto the rigs and do various different things. So that kind of creates a number of tensions. But the oil industry is in a, a state of transition. So the purpose of Larwick as a hub of this industry is changing. The context of Larwick as a context for work is changing. And then it's starting to kind of invite people to think about the future of work. So the thing that was dependable, the job I could have, is not necessarily dependable for the future. So, so we've got areas which were work dominant around sectors transitioning into different bits, and they've affected by the COVID, but also by macroeconomic shifts. If we then kind of move into another part of Scotland, which is not that far away from Shetland, as the crow flies, but actually quite a long swim if you have to go for it. And this is a this is in Caithness, this is Thurso, and uh, uh, again, a really beautiful, stunning uh, assemblage of buildings where a hostile wind rolls in from the sea and beats you. It, it doesn't greet you, it beats you, and, and you're blown sideways, and then you kind of stand up, and it's a, it's a very immersive environmental experience. And over in Caithness, it's now starting to mobilise around the renewable industry, and it's starting to mobilise around the decommissioning of Dunaray. So big industries and in remote places changing, one coming up, one coming down, and the transition between it. An issue for Th for Caithness and Thurso, as it will be for a number of uh, Welsh small places and, and, and English small places, is this tension around depopulation. So there is work here, but not everybody wants to come here. There is work here, and when people come, they often leave because the social context and the remote context is too hostile for them. So how do you manage the tension of places which want to sustain themselves, need population, and then kind of move through different things. So how do you repopulate uh, places that are shifting? And, and how, if work is mobile, do, do these two locales I've just described with the stunning geography and the amazing history and the fantastic environments start to anchor and locate work in real terms, and that that work then supports economies in real terms, and that that economy then supports communities in real terms? And the answer is it's not simple. In the COVID bit, uh, one of the bits of work that I was uh, uh, really privileged to, to help out with um, was to kind of understand the experience of COVID um, in different locales across Scotland in the, in the heart of the urban and city context, but also in the town and the rural kind of context, and just understand what is the context of what's happening, and therefore what is the context of what's needed, and therefore what is the context of what's possible. And it's difficult to separate the social context and the work context because it's kind of linked as, as the speakers thus far have talked about we're, we're into the kind of the different social contexts of of work and movement five key themes emerged from that discussion by talking to individuals groups uh, organizations and communities and the five key themes were number one it's not just that COVID has hit um, pre-existing issues in communities it's opened up new vulnerabilities and some of those are hidden so a context for work in the transition from now to next to later is around how well-being things which are hidden are going to get manifest and how it's supported 
in the different settings people might move through. So increasingly work becomes a setting to identify, work becomes a setting to support, work becomes one of the contexts within which some of these issues are manifest. Number two, um, what worked in COVID in the lockdown and in communities was uh, where partnerships formed, not necessarily leveraging stuff that was there, partnerships organizing. It was like, let's get going, let's do things. And they were all organized around impact, get food to the families, get employment down to the local people, get money to the businesses. So impact oriented um, partnerships, that's quite important around a context for distributed work because those partnerships then become the anchor to hook the social context to work, but also then to, to mobilize the distributed bit. Number three, uh, the capabilities, the distribution of resources is trust-based. So it wasn't necessarily that money went to organizations in the heart of the lockdown. It went to trusted people in trusted places to do trusted stuff. So there's a different institutional issue around how we recognize and support trust. And one of the issues around that is that as it's happened, then people expect to accelerate it. So there's three things thus far. There's, there's the vulnerabilities that are now new and manifest around work. Secondly, uh, impact oriented partnerships and three around trust. They set up an institutional context for the future of work and employment and enterprise. Number four, it's the issue around um, distribution of, of access to resources. Wouldn't it be great if digital worked everywhere? It doesn't. Wouldn't it be great if everyone could use the internet? They can't. Wouldn't it be great if all of the stuff that's supposed to work works? It doesn't. So, so there are issues that we have to address around digital equity and spatial equity and environmental equity. So the differential equities across different locales and communities is really fundamental to how we understand the context of work now, the context of work moving forward. The final bit then is that what's really worked is when people come together around a common purpose. So it's not just meeting for meeting's sake, it's meeting to do. And as we start to look at the reality, not the rhetoric of distributed work, the common purpose bit is essential. There is no way that we can repopulate areas unless there is a common purpose to galvanize collaboration, to hook in the economy, to create the pathway for new and different opportunities. So five things, one, hidden harm, we need to address that in moving forward. Two, social partnerships need to be impact oriented. Three, the trust has been developed. People expect more of it. Number four, we need to address the infrastructure of distribution. And number five, that then comes down to the heart of so common purpose at the heart of collaboration. To build that then into kind of four potential contexts for how distributed work could move um, and agile work and work from home. And, and, and these are around choices. So number one is that what's worked in most locations, in most locales and whatnot, is the post office stay, stayed open, the shop stayed open, uh, the builder was able to fix things. So, so to sustain local work, then there is something around place-based collaboration to make sure that there is more opportunity for more people at more uh, local levels. And that, that is a policy decision that Scotland is pursuing in other places around um, resource collaboration, asset collaboration, and opportunity creation. It's not the case that there's a buoyant localism at the moment. It is the case that there's lots of people stored in locations, but that hasn't yet leveraged into active localism. So to be able to move from what's happening to what's possible, we need then to kind of construct more place-based choices. Number two is that although we've talked about the, the green uh, economy and the low carbon economy, um, recent discussions in, 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 the, in the Guardian and other bits are kind of looking at how much green work has been created. So green investment, huge, green work, how much? And then that kind of gets you to start thinking about where are the supply chains into green uh, transformation? Uh, where's the green work in it? Where's the green consultancy in it? And how does that uh, all start to kind of come together? And it also starts to look at transitions in the way retail and banking are moving so that there's more local bits. So we need to kind of look at the transition management and that relates to the, to the remote and rural because it will affect them in different ways, sometimes opportunistically around natural assets and renewable industries, and that's great, sometimes because some of the things you need have moved. Number three, um, one of the, the issues that's starting to emerge around public functions in Scotland and also around some of the uh, corporate functions in the private sector and the third sector is around the, the potential to decentralize to rural, to go to the rural areas, 
to stay instead of reoccupy back into the city and progress commuting patterns to offer up the opportunity to locate a Thurso or Portree or Ochenlec or wherever it might be. But the issue with decentralization is number one, the strategic decision to do that. And number two, it's actually about the readiness of the place to host new and different functions. And that then ties very much into, into John's point around new and different workspaces and, and Andy's point around uh, the, the realities of remote working and then also into Alex's piece around the, the AI. The final bit then is in, in a lot of uh, uh, rural areas in Scotland, people have moved there because their wife got a job there and the husband follows. Or people have moved there because the husband got a job and the, the husband follows. And sometimes it's by circumstance and then life moves and does its thing and stuff. And, and one of the things that we're trying to look at now is that it's rural by choice. And there's an interesting piece here around two cohorts. The first is around uh, young people who may choose to set up startups and who have a lot of allegiance to the environment and to the landscape and, and different things. So new and different types of startup in new and remote areas. That's really interesting. But the other cohort are highly paid, well-skilled and senior management people who become mobile in organizations and can choose to locate in different places. So, so they're starting to kind of look at rural by choice. So to bring it backwards, I suppose the point is uh, the, the reality of distributed working and, and remote working um, and the rhetoric of it need to be interrogated a bit. We need to kind of set up the conditions for real choices in rural places. And that seems to be around accelerating and developing on the learning that we've gained from the COVID. And then that kind of seems to frame around four potential conditions around a resilient localism about being transparent around the, the transition to, to net zero and capitalizing on it, about uh, place readiness for decentralization, and finally, uh, to really push for places by choice. Thank you. Fantastic. Thanks, Dermot. Um, that was really interesting. Um, I think, um, yeah, it's, as you said, there's lots of kind of common threads through <clears throat> all four of um, the, the presentations and discussions we've had so far. Um, and I think that idea of you know are we ready to or are places able to accommodate what we want them to do or the way we want to go um is probably one that's that's quite interesting um right we'll open it up to the floor now so um if anyone wants to say anything or um ask any questions of any of the speakers or just make a point please do as i said either you can either raise your hand on um zoom or put something in the chat box um i thought um Zoe Maria's point. I don't know whether um, you want to come on and and kind of say it or add to it in person. Um, but I thought the the comment you put in the chat there was quite interesting, really, which it kind of ties into what you were just talking about, Zerman, in terms of you know our place is ready for remote working, even if we want to to work remotely. Um, and actually, I think that that idea of retrofitting neighbourhoods and making places work. Um, I don't know if. So do you want to add anything to that or are you um, happy um, to see if there's any other thoughts? Yeah, it's just a really weird situation for me, especially because I, I bought, well, with my husband, bought my house right at the beginning of lockdown number one, which was a weird experience. Um, but I'm in this sort of suburban wasteland where I have the things that I absolutely need, doctor, surgery and supermarket. But I have no reason to go outside anymore. I mean, I can. I There is a park uh, five minutes walk away and I do try and go out there. But I don't, I don't go into the centre of my town anymore. I mean, not that I really did before because I lived on the outskirts. But the, all of those meanwhile spaces, those pop-ups, those, um, those uses of what we could do with our high streets how are we going to integrate those for those people who live too far away to take advantage of them because otherwise we'll end up with people who live in the city center who are living in an entirely different bubble world to people who live like quite a lot of us i assume in nice family houses in nice neighborhoods who don't really have any facilities because they're all in town centers yeah no it's a good point actually i think it's something um that that brian um had put in a couple of comments on the chat as well about 
um, you know, recognizing that people's circumstances are very different. I know um, from sort of conversations I've had with people that, um, for example, a lot of one of the things that's come out of this is that there's a lot of sort of senior managers um, in big companies who perhaps didn't quite realize the kind of how their junior staff lived. Um, and, you know, have been a bit shocked and horrified that there's sort of four or five of them in a house and that they're all having to sit on the end of their bed and use an, an ironing board as a desk because, you know, they're kind of in an executive home somewhere on the outskirts of town and, and life's fine. They're working from home. It's not a big thing, but actually, you know, everyone's circumstances are different, as you say. For some people, they've got everything on their doorstep. Other people don't have everything on their doorstep. Um, and I think that I think that kind of difference between between everyone is going to be one of the key factors in actually what happens and how it all settles down. I don't know if any of the other um, sort of panel members want to to comment at all. Yeah, no, I, I would, Paul. Actually, um, I, I think one of the issues that COVID has highlighted is equity uh, you know so that um and I, I sense this quite a lot so uh, in the return to school for example um teachers are now going to have young people in front of them of varying different ages um but there's a, another bunch of the population that are still at home we're still working from home so there's inequity in the way that the, the work balance is kind of working out and then throughout it uh, people working in shops and people engineering and fitting different things have had a very, very different experience of work. But to Zoe's point, then some of the things that they, those people needed weren't open and weren't available. So we, 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 I think we have to kind of look at the, the, the kind of equity uh, bit. And, and that then kind of creates an interesting question around, to, to your point, Zoe, you don't have to create, but there are some things that we must locate in each community to make sure that the resilience function is there. So there's a key question around distribution. Are the essential things available for all people in all communities? So that's a, that's a first question. I think the second question is, um, one of the startling bits that has emerged in Scotland is around the experience of COVID across different age groups. And of course, the older age group have experienced a, a very intense bit, but the more chilling bit is the, the experience of COVID has been more intense for the 18 to 40 year old cohort. So much more loneliness for younger people and working age people. And so I think one of the things that that addresses around employers is their, their awareness of the differential in, in, in household formation. There are some people on their own, there are some people whose life are kind of moved around. So there's a well being awareness and a responsibility around that. But at local level, that starts to invite a question around curated experiences. So how do we create um, programs of purpose? How do we invite people to gather and move? So not just rely on spontaneous bit, curated experience. And then I think the final bit is that um, the other bit that COVID and, and to your point, Zoe, you know, why would you go out? I think one of the things is that um, there, there are two issues emerging um, around this. One is, that uh, communities are starting to construct new ways of delivering service. And so there's a reason to meet. So there's that side of it. But the other bit is that people are starting to transition in work. So lifelong learning has become an increasingly important function, midpoint career change, uh, unemployment bits. And that lends itself to, to, again, thinking about curated experiences locally. So how can we access peer support and, and supportive context locally, blending with digital? So, for me, I think there's three bits. One is a distribution bit around equity. Two is around curated experiences on well-being, And three, it's around the lifelong learning um, at local level and starting to construct new meanings, new invitations, new ways to gather. I guess that kind of feeds back into what you were talking about, Alex, as well. And this idea that, you know, people have sort of second jobs or, or hobby jobs, whatever you might want to call them. So, you know, three days a week, maybe they're a you know, banker in the city, but actually two days a week, they're also a... I don't know pie maker or something in their local village and go around door to door selling pies you know it's that yeah. it's that idea that it's splitting out a bit more yeah i mean i think th those those options it's about choice it's about given that um you know most most people um i've kind of come into contact with have uh, are able to capitalize on this um uh, agile way of working um, basically working in sort of some sort of knowledge con economy related job. 
um, the, the, they have uh, the choice to be agile. Um, their choice almost exclusively is not to work from home, whether they can or they can't, whether they've got, you know, a, a big house or live in an apartment. I mean, probably the majority of my colleagues live in city apartments. Um, and so there's a lot of people who are not, who find it very stressful working from home. Um, which is why I've noticed this trend for a demand for co-working spaces and not the sort of hipster kind of co-working spaces, but just somewhere convenient to just work. Um, and, uh, and yeah, and, and the, and it's true. Yeah. I have seen a very sort of noticeable, it's something that, um, Dermot was just talking about there about, um, uh, learning, uh, and, and things like that. That's, that's also caused me sort of pause for thought as well. But what I've noticed is people picking up these sort of, uh, side sort of jobs and in artisan trades and things like that. Um, because the opportunity seems to be there. Um, so I think people are experiencing choice and um, and and capitalising it on it seems to me, um, and and they're sort of giving some sort of reality to what before was a sort of theoretical trend. Just my sort of observation, really. Yeah. The past year. Andy or John, did you want to add anything on that? I think from, from our perspective, working with end users, what, one thing that I've found really positive in the last year is there's, it feels like there's been a lot more engagement with staff about, you know, where businesses are changing their workplace. They are taking the time to talk to people. And, you know, I've noticed one particular project actually in Scotland where there's a very strong young, you sort of younger um, uh, group um, of, you know, graduate young employees. And they've been very forthright in saying, we can't wait to get back to the office. You know, we're very excited about it and we're going to be there five days a week because, you know, as you say, we, we, we don't have the capacity for work from home and we want to benefit from the, um, you know, the, the social aspect. So they're excited about the new sort of office design we're talking about, but I think they're, they're, they're perhaps a little bit more reserved about, you know, the idea of, of hybrid working and spending too much time, um, you know, in working in their bedrooms. Mm. Yeah, I mean it's an interesting point. I think the point as well about the um, the sort of shared workspaces and co-working. Um, I know I mean, we're our office studio is based in a co-working building, um, and I was chatting to the building manager a couple of days ago, and he said that sort of since Boris has announced the pathway out, that he's found that sort of inquiries have absolutely skyrocketed. Um, you know, and he was hit quite hard at the beginning of this. A lot of people were like, well, I'm not paying 100 quid a month or 200 quid a month for a desk that I can't sit at. So all of a sudden, kind of all of his customers left. But now, actually, um, he's inundated with people that are sort of like, I've been stuck at home for a year. I want to get out of the house. Um, and, you know, and just generally, I know someone the other day was saying that, you know, before all of this, I think for a number of months, we work with the largest um, new occupier of office space in central London. Um, they see it, you know, and, and effectively, you've got here a model where people, people who in theory could work from home are actually willing to pay money to go to an office. And this isn't people that work for large employers who kind of have no choice. There's a large number of people that are self-employed and in theory can work wherever they want, yet they're happy to, to pay money to go to an office, which is a bit like what you were talking about, I think, Andy, at the start. But um, I move on. Um, I see Peter Jones has his hand up. Peter, if you want to ask a question. Yeah, thanks very much, Paul. Um, it's a sort of comment really to get, well, a, a proposition to get people's reaction to really. Um, John mentioned, and people have said quite a lot, you know, rule of thumb, people probably come into the office three days a week. And that means some company can get rid of 40% of their, um, their office space. And again, from a transport point of view, you could say, well, actually it means we don't have to have these really expensive carriages just for peak periods. Over time, you know, we can reduce down, we'll become more efficient. But if you think that along horizontally and then vertically almost, it also means, for example, people who are employed in, in um, shops selling sandwiches and things will only need 60% of those. So there'll be some loss of employment. But the other side of it is that if people work three days a week coming into their offices, won't they all want to do Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday? So they're at home Monday and Friday. So there's a risk we'll end up with the same peaks and need that same total peak capacity. We'll actually use it only three days a week rather than five days a week. And I wonder what we can do about that, um, either in terms of the way we design things to encourage people to spread over the week or, or through uh, policies that 
you know, office level or, or at, at um, you know, London and, and citywide level. Just wonder what people thought about that. Anyone want to? I, I think I saw uh, um, a figure yesterday suggesting that the the worst case scenario for for transport in London was that only sixty percent of people of of of, of uh, traffic would come back, and I couldn't help thinking that that might be the best case, you know, in 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 some respects. So I, you know, I think I think, you know, that in terms of the question of what fills the gap. Um, you know that's an open question and something people are starting to grapple with. In terms of the the idea of the sort of peak and trough, you know that's that's a very live issue, and I think it is necessitating, you know, to the idea of curating the workspace. You know, businesses are having to be, you know, whilst they might be saving money by reducing the amount of space they occupy, they're going to have to work a lot harder to manage that space, and that come, you know, things like you know, the sort of the idea of curating activities through the week, making sure that things are happening on, on Mondays and Fridays, you know, making sure that space is managed in a way that, that, that works efficiently, you know, creating incentives for, um, for working on those less popular days. Um, and, um, you, you, you know, make, 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 making sure that, that, that you do, um, you know that, that you do take full advantage and 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 have a space that's busy all the time. Um, I think I think is is going to be really important. But as far as as far, you know, coming back to filling the gap, I think that's that is a real challenge, and we're very keen. I think one of the questions that I think Brian brought up on the chat around, you know, um, the the idea of the Google campus with lots of expensive facilities. I do think it's really important that we don't try and do that within buildings. We try and reach out and make sure that we're that we're um, that, that buildings are engaging with the wider community and, and and becoming part of a thriving economy. Yeah, I'd I'd, <laughs> I'd agree with that. It, it, it's interesting thinking about which days people would come in. Um, I I almost suspect Wednesday would be the day that everybody wants to stay at home, <laughs> um, with with the flexibility of having the odd Friday and and Monday uh, when they need a long weekend. Um, <laughs> It is interesting. We don't know, do we? We don't know what's going to happen. Um, I, you know, I mean, I think it, it's part of the diversification of, of these of these of these workplaces, and it's giving people the option to to do what they want. It also may tie in nicely with the with the idea of the four four day work week as well, um, where you know that extra day is actually spent in people's communities um, helping. Um, people don't necessarily, you know, they don't want to sit down watching TV all day. They don't necessarily even want the day out off. They just want to feel feel valued. Um, yeah, it's it's very interesting. It's very interesting. Um, but I, yeah, I, the, can I follow up on that? Sorry. Yeah, I think that's an interesting point, Andy. Um, and it makes me think back about something we 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 looked at to do with automation. And how if you follow the sort of the positive line on AI and that the fourth industrial revolution, we're all gonna have much more time and that we should maybe be thinking about the four day week. Um, and again, for me, for me, it just, there just seems to be a, an obvious opportunity here to sort of refocus on locality, you know, home, home life and home community with having more time and more opportunity to, to put your your working hours and more leisure hours into into your community, and I think the other thing that I've been thinking is people have been people have been talking quite a bit about movement, about what days would we go from home to city and da da da. But when when you think that more and more people are choosing, uh, you know, active travel to get to work and would quite like to use that to commute. Um, the sort of the, the catchment is getting smaller and smaller and the intensity of linked trips, you know, going out for lunch to, to do things, do your shopping on the way home and everything gets more and more intense. Again, it's a, it's a very big opportunity for communities, local communities uh, for me within a sort of walking cycling catchment of, of where, where people live. Um, I know I'm a little bit, I've been sort of six years in Sweden now and I'm a bit sort of, I know that Swedish, towns and cities function a little bit differently to I suppose most people in the meeting are from the UK but 
it, it, it's certainly it, it's I'm I'm seeing it happen because we've been in this slightly unique situation of people being sort of it, it, instructed to work from home, but having having the opportunity around them to start using ser services and meeting their friends for lunch to do stuff in in the locality and things like that. And I think with the, this opportunity of maybe being able to work less and having more automation you know, in the long term is, is just adding to that opportunity, yeah. I think. Let, let's, let's not forget that, um, you know, the, 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 the remote working um, idea, it doesn't necessarily mean everybody has to work nine to five either. That, you know, we could be talking, we could be seeing the dream of the 24 hour city happening, you know, and those who want to go in overnight can do, or those who want to go for a walk to their coffee shop at three o'clock in the afternoon when everybody else is usually at work, then, then these things can happen. So I'm just reading the comment about the, the hospitality industry, not knowing where things will be. But if we think about it, everything's just been so city centre central for so long. And we're actually expanding out. We're actually, you know, are we close to achieving the, the urban village reality that we always talked about um, from the, uh, you know, the urban task force report or something like that, um, where, we, where we have these communities that are interlinked and we have the access to, to, the, to the cities on our doorstep when we, when we need them. I don't know, it's interesting. Yeah, I think it is. I mean, actually, I'll just see there's a, a comment come up there. Um, Jamie Ashton was put about... Um, PDR. I don't know whether or not Jamie, would you want to come in and talk about that a bit more? Because I think, um, from my point of view, that is something that is going to have a bearing on it. I know um, a few years ago now, when we were looking for for office space, I lived sort of in Zone Four of London, out in the suburbs, um, and we were looking to see whether there was anywhere local to have. And at that time, nearly all of the small office spaces that were mostly above shops in the local high street, um, local town centres. Um, you know, no one would let it to you, even if there was vacant space, you'd often be told it's kind of, you know, agents wouldn't get back to you. And it was fairly clear. It was all around trying to make it look like there's no demand for it because they wanted to convert it into residential. And of course, now we're in this situation where actually, um, you know, a lot of people want to work locally. I know I've rediscovered my local high street over the past year. Um, and the, the kind of altering my working hours, Andy, like you were just talking about, you know, it is that we're actually... I'll get up and do a couple of hours work. Then I might go out and do something else, go and get a coffee, have an hour off, and then, you know, work a bit later into the evening and kind of the, the, the kind of nine to five day has, has shifted. Um, and I think we will see a change with PDR about how, I suppose, how those town centres look and how they function. Um, it kind of, again, crosses over a little bit with what um, Demo was talking about, about the kind of retrofitting rural areas as well and where perhaps there's, pressure on commercial spaces to be converted to resi because of a lack of demand are we suddenly going to see that demand going back um i don't know jamie did you want to come in and talk about that at all yeah um just um it's really interesting to me the question about um um how to accommodate demand for new ways of living in places which have been built to um, live in like suburbs or, or or to dwell in rather than live in so you're just you're just living there um you're just sleeping there and then traveling to a city um and there's something about uh, the sort of aggregate the sort of aggregation of sort of capital and land ownership um like you just touched upon there in in sort of single use places which um weighs against um the kind of mixed use um places that um, we would we would might want to see or that might accommodate a more varied lifestyle, uh, and I thought it was really interesting. I really loved um, John's presentation and the um, places that Tesco are trying to recreate are these kind of mixed use, essentially small pieces of um, what we would consider urbanity um, um, for their use. And you drive to get there, um, and it would have um, sort of food and um, interesting places to to to. To be in, in there, so it was. It was really just a technical question, really. Just um, how you could imagine sort of individual um, dwelling houses in suburban layout being um, converted to a sort of public, um, a, a mini library or a mini workspace. Um, so it's really just to provoke that that thought. I mean, um, while acknowledging the sort of um, the, the aggregation of capital and the sort of legal framework that can. You would have to 
um, sort of respond to or, or act against in order to achieve a more flexible um, development landscape. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think I think it's a really fundamental point, and I know um, we we sort of had a look at at the start of lockdown around this idea of was there a way of having workspaces that people could work locally instead of the commute in, and we kind of took a, a line that I think that a zone one to four travel card that I would pay each month to get into town was about 200 quid on the tube you know what could I get within walking distance for 200 pounds where I could say look instead of paying 200 pounds to get the tube into the city I'll pay 200 pounds for a desk in a vacant retail unit for example along with half a dozen other people you know would that enable us to create a kind of a shared workspace and I think um what we were looking at at the time just trying to run some numbers was that it probably wouldn't work in a covid safe environment where everyone was have to be certain distance apart but actually in a normal time when we can be a bit closer together um actually that you know potentially it would stack up and i think um there was a story just a couple of weeks ago about one of the big um companies in the us who have bought a shopping mall an out of town or an edge of town shopping mall and they're going to turn it into their offices with sort of different people having uh, different departments in different retail units and then actually the whole mall would become their office and you've got this kind of common communal spaces I suppose in a food court and a whatever um, and actually that they could kind of see a shopping mall being as a, a suitable space to repurpose as a large office which I thought was a an intriguing um, idea but um, I see there's a couple of Stephen has got his hand, his manual hand up, and James has got a virtual hand up. I don't know, Stephen, if you want to come in first. Yes, thank you very much. And thank you for a very good presentation, which I've enjoyed very much so far. I'm wondering whether the villain in the piece in the circumstances is planning and of the planning constraints, which are too tightly, too tightly drawn by local authorities. I mean, we have, for the whole of the last century, we've had swathes of housing and swathes of industrial development and people have had to commute in order to get one from, to one from one to the other surely one of the it's certainly in the longer term one of the one of the most satisfactory things we can do or get our mps to do at any rate is to soften the planning constraints to allow local authorities to have very much greater flexibility in allowing the land use to be to be something to which will can help to engage the local community. Here we are stay, here we are saying yes, we must live and work closer together if only so that we, so that we can uh, cycle and um, uh, cycle and walk to and from work. And there are various initiatives. The twenty um, Portland Oregon's they have they have. Oh, Anyway, sorry, I'm getting a bit, a bit tongue twisted, but I'm wondering whether we can sort of take to our MPs the, the notion that planning must be a little bit more flexible if we're going to realise everything that we've been talking about so far. Yeah, no, I, mean, I think it's a, a good point. I mean, I, I see John's just put in the chat there about the new use class E. I think um, the, the kind of one of the positives that almost got lost last year over the... Um, over everything else was the fact that the new use class E was brought in, which would allow that much greater flexibility for buildings to, to kind of shift between classes so that actually you could be more flexible in how spaces were used and how vacant units and shops could actually move around. I suppose, fortunately, what we've now seen is the government saying that they're also going to allow all of the use class E to become residential or potentially under permitted development, which will be a massive retrograde step um, unfortunately, but um, I think, you know, I think you're right. I think that flexibility, I mean, there was a great quote, um, I think it was Roger Evans or someone spoke ages ago at one of our events where he said, you know, the, the, the office is a new invention. I think it was the East India Company about 1720 something opened the first office. Um, but the city um, and, you know, town, village has been around for thousands of years. And actually, you know, the idea of coming together, people coming together for, trade um and to to kind of socialize is far far older than the idea of sitting in a an office at a desk um that, that we kind of see as our work environment today so i think um what we probably will see is this evolution and i think there's certainly been a much greater investment and interest in 
place and community um, that's that's come out of this. Um, I'll let others come in in a minute. I just see James has had his hand up for ages. James, did you want to just um... can, I, can can I just can I just say yeah sure yeah sorry. in order to realise this uh, one of the, one of the products of realising what I'm suggesting is that commuting will become very much less of a burden for everybody. The traffic will become so much less of a burden for everybody. At the moment, a great many of our author local authorities, mine in particular in Barnet, are sort of dividing up streets for cycles and buses and all the rest of it. And it's causing the greatest confusion of, of congestion of, tra of traffic. And so much of what we are, what, what, what we, what we're what we're wanting of wanting for ourselves can be so much eased if only if if if, if only if only we could ease ease the restrictions on planning. Yeah, no, I agree. I think it comes back to Peter's point from earlier as well about you know this idea that everything has to be designed for kind of peak um, movement of people, and actually, if we don't have to do that, if we can limit some of that movement, particularly on a day-to-day -day basis, um, it will ease things a lot. And I guess that's partly what underpins the, you know, the 15 minute city, 20 minute neighborhoods yeah. that we're hearing so much about. And that idea that you can get to stuff locally and, and not have to travel quite as far. Um, I will go, James, did you want to come in as you've got your virtual hand up? Thank you, Paul. Uh, to reinforce what you said uh, about offices being a recent invention, Lloyd's of London was a coffee house. It was a social space at first, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, I, and Vanessa Gregory has said everybody misses the social contact. I would like to seek views on the extent to which people will not travel, not, not the question of traveling to and from an office or a studio or whatever for work every day, most days, or, but will travel between places for work. The people who go to a site meeting, go to somebody else's office in Manchester or Birmingham, or Milton Keynes, whatever it might be, or travel around the world on, a, in a, on an aircraft in order to meet people. And the extent to which we've learned as we have about commuting every day on the tube, that that isn't necessary. Um, I'd like to say something on that. Yeah, go for it. Um, I think that's a really uh, interesting point and, and it resonates with me particularly because the, in the last year, well, I flew back from Rwanda where I've been working for a while as, as COVID landed in Denmark. I mean, it sort of landed behind me in the queue sort of thing. And, and I just managed to get home. Uh, and I haven't, I haven't left the country since then. I haven't left my house since then, almost. Um, and, but I've been um, trying to uh, work on three projects in Africa since then, uh, where, where usually I would have been traveling quite often. And that's been a really extraordinary experience to, to, and, and a, a great learning curve. And it's amazing how much we have managed to do actually it's had its problems um and there's there's deep sort of guilt that we're not there and doing really understanding the place properly and all these sorts of things but actually it's it's amazing how we've discovered ways of working not only with clients but with stakeholders um we've we've been doing drone we've got a great company taking 3d object data from a drone so you know we can photograph in 3D of this site we're working on. Um, so it's that is just my personal experience of that has been really uh, extraordinary. I never thought I never thought it would have been possible actually. Mm. I don't know if anybody else has, has, has had experience with it, you know, the international or well, as, as James says. Yeah, I, 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 I similar, I like say, <clears throat> Uh, one of the things that the pandemic has done, I think, is provoked conversations and provoked relationship building. So I've had chats with people in Canada and people in uh, different parts of the of the world. So that's been that's been really fantastic. And to build a community of participation in different ways, I think, has been really powerful. On the and and I think the other side of that though is that our lives are networked. So I'm in Scotland, but my family is in Ireland. So I haven't been back in a year. So our geographies are not just determined by the work bit. You know, it's determined by different contexts. So there will be a need to move between geographies. And, and for young people, one of the dilemmas I think around 20 minute neighborhood and local kind of bits is it is absolutely right for young people to be able to move physically to different places 
to experience and discover and fail and recover and whatnot and move around. So I think there's a number of, of reasons for people to move. But in, in, in terms of the future, it, it, it really makes me think about the value of face-to-face. -face. So when we do come face-to-face, -face, the value of that experience probably is going to be more. That will be a higher order, higher value activity, potentially a longer duration activity. So not just rushing over the city to meet for 20 minutes. Maybe there are immersive meetings, maybe there are very uh, kind of a, a more collaborative kind of bit. So I think there's something around reconfiguring or redefining the value of face to face and, and, and that potentially again on the rural side becomes a really interesting bit because you could go to a rural remote place for two days and have a very immersive experience as your organization and connect in in different ways or a valuable face to face kind of experience in different ways. So, so for me, one of the bits around the digital world has been great on participation, but it's also made me think deeply about the value of face-to-face -face and the things that you cannot see on Skype and cannot experience on WhatsApp. It's this kind of a invisible, high density communication that happens when people are present and, 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 and kind of thinking about that differently. So I think it's great and we're doing really great stuff. I think that the face-to-face -face thing has the potential to be redefined as a higher order experience with loads of different support infrastructures needed around that. And, and also I think it's important to be mindful of the geography of our lives as networked, not always locally situated. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's something that going back to our study we did a few years ago, that, that, was, so that was a clear conclusion that that uh, all these opportunities for for a network based uh, working culture is is fantastic but you can't leverage any of those real op opportunities and benefits and optimize those relationships without physically meeting and that's why suddenly the, the focus is placed back on the physical world and and the public realm and spaces to meet uh, and the quality of the environment and also a new kind of space to facilitate things like you know the shared economy and the circularity and these things these are new kinds of spaces um and my own view is that these are all interesting opportunities for high streets maybe <laughs> i think yeah. it's really to, sorry i, I think it's really to, to, to look at the you know the, the historical precedence of, of of some of this actually in terms of in terms of um how these places functioned you know we we are so focused again on the big metropolis where actually in in the past every little small settlement with the town center with the high street functioned in the same way so the trick is trying to trying to trying to trying to get that back again um i think the the thing about meetings um i, I think we've all been in a lot of meetings where they've just dragged on and on and on and often you've experienced being in more meetings well too many meetings and not had time to get the work done so the brilliant thing about lockdown is that meetings have become very concise not least because zoom restricting a lot of people to an hour um so i think that's a really positive thing um my own experience uh, through lockdown actually was was site visits actually it's, it's, it's very interesting um hearing alex talk about that um this is hopefully something we won't have to sacrifice in the past and i would never ever advocate not going on site but it is possible and that's that's the that's the interesting thing about all the resource we have whether it's google maps google street view um or, or you know the, the lot of the from my point of view a lot of the historical maps on online and you can really do a, a lot of work i did a, a, a local list study um i did it completely remotely and then when restrictions opened i actually got on site and had a look at these buildings physically in the flesh and i'm glad to say i didn't have to change any of my um, sig significant statements for any of them, which was great, you know, and it just proved to me that actually you can get a lot of certainty from, from remote working. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think going back to one of the points earlier about, about movement into town and, 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 and the restrictions on planning. Um, I don't know. I, I, I think I, I, you know, I, I just think that our historic towns and our, our, our focus of settlement is, is the key to this. And small and different levels of scale of settlement. Um, I think that's a really interesting thing, and it's it's something that has lots of historical precedents as well. Yeah, I mean, I think it's um, I think as you say, the I think we've kind of learned some new tools for the Arsenal, irrespective of 
what we actually go back to. I think, you know, there are certainly some meetings and calls that I'm sure will be held on Zoom now just because it's, you know, it's more cost efficient, you know, rather than draw, dragging everyone half an hour to, to somewhere for a short meeting, um, there are still definitely things that it were better in person. And I think, you know, I've sat through a couple of very awkward workshops, which really you do struggle to do um, online. Um, but I think sort of certainly for some calls, definitely, you know, a, a 20 minute Zoom can get something done that would have taken you a couple of hours by the time you traveled to a meeting and got back again. So I think it will be a kind of blended situation. And the same with, you know, design review panels. Um, I've had a couple where, um, sort of the use of Google Earth has actually aided us significantly over, you know, absolutely agree with you, you have to go to site and, uh, and miss massively going to site. But actually, we had one in particular, which was an incredibly complicated set of buildings. And actually, just the ability for everyone to look on Google Earth, you really got your head around how the site worked in a way that I don't think we'd ever have comprehended from being there. Um, and actually, you know, we've sort of talked about going forward, having having Google Earth as a tool in design review panels will probably be something that we do look to, to keep, even though we look to get on site. Um, Judith, I understand you want to come in. Run me, Judith. Yeah. Yes, uh, I find this discussion quite interesting, but very much from one point of view. And that is from the work, me, 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 how does it change things for me and how is my life going to be better and all that sort of thing. Um, I just had a conversation with somebody who uses the services as a business service. And he told me how very difficult it was now that people are not in the office and that everything is so fragmented and said the slightest thing he wants to arrange from his business with a bank is an absolute nightmare and it takes him days when it took minutes. So I think one has to also look at all these kind of changes from the client point of view, from the ones you, you work for. And I think that that is usually there is just an absence of discussion about this this dimension. It seems to me, not just here, but in general, hmm. because the, the impact is not just on 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 the workers themselves or maybe the the, the employers, but it is also on the, the whole business uh, ecology. I think, and 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 that includes the clients. That includes they will have beautiful offices where you have your own coffee places and, and leisure places and so on and so forth. Well, like Google has now. And that means it's it, all the places around there are no longer necessary, no, no cafes, no nothing. It's quite deserted around that particular place exactly. So it has these kind of secondary and further impacts. Mm. I think one has to look at those as well. Yeah, no, you're, I think you're right. And I think it comes back to the, the point that Vanessa put in the chat earlier as well about, you know, the social aspect of it all and how how people go to those different spaces. And certainly, you know, one of the things I miss about going into town is the ability to go out after work with work colleagues or meet friends and, you know, the ease of going to the theatre at kind of short notice or deciding to stay out for have dinner out that night. Um, and that kind of, that's all been lost. And I know, in fact, just yesterday, I was, I was chatting to a neighbour who... Um, who used to have a sit, uh, sort of a, an office in Westminster and gave that up last year and she's now working from home um, and she's been talking to her clients and so they sort of said exactly that you know they're not as worried that that maybe she won't have an office in town but actually one of them said but you know we're surely we're still going to be able to meet up and go for a coffee and you know when I when I need to brief you on something you know I, I always enjoyed catching up over a coffee and having those conversations and it's not the same and you know will you still come into town um even though you sort of live you know 25 minutes out of town on the tube will you still come into town to meet with me and she sort of said yes you know absolutely I will and actually I'm looking forward to it in the sense that no longer am I going to have to get on the tube at seven o'clock in the morning with everyone else to get kind of into into the office for eight o'clock. I can now, you know, arrange to meet you for a coffee at 10 and I can come in when I want to and I can hang in round as long as I want to and go back when I want to. And actually it's kind of really not having the office um, has sort of released her from having, I suppose, the commute but it's still given her that flexibility to go in and out of town um, and to meet with a client. And I think that is, I think that is a really important um, point. I don't know if any other speakers want to come in on that. Yeah, I, I, I think um, 
the the wider context of work and the, uh, as, as Judith said, the kind of the primary and secondary bits are really important and that for some people in some workspaces, uh, they, they, the social contact is crucial, you know, so you're busy during the day and it's, it's, it's it, for people who've moved to a city first, it's one of the key bits of building a sense of being and community and that's lost to people. Um, but also the wider opportunities that the locale around work affords people and sustains, I think is really important. So, so if we start to think about uh, those bits, I suppose back to Alex's point, some of the new types of space and some of the new interactions are really important around supporting the, the, the different bits and that's where I totally agree. I said, Bob, you had your hand up. Did you want to come in on that? Yeah, thanks. Hi, guys. Um, I've been trying to do a lot of work with um, my local council. And um, the one thing that it is, is absolutely clear is that this is an ideal opportunity for communities to come together and start to redefine the kind of community that they wish to live in. Because there is a massive disconnect between councillors, reality, um, finances, um, and what people actually genuinely want. I mean, in Chichester, for instance, there was a limit on the number of coffee shops, but the limit was always maxed out and without them realizing that the coffee shop was essential to the, the life and death of the high street. And the, one of the other points that's come out is that it's like seeing this as a, a fantastic opportunity for people to redefine their lives, redefine a multi-life as opposed to a, I mean, the whole concept of work is for me, it's doing something that I'm passionate about and getting paid for it. And um, is that a definition of work or is that a definition of me being very lucky to um, have that opportunity? I have loved lockdown. I have met so many people. I have learned so much. One of the reasons I'm here tonight is that had I not had lockdown, would I be meeting all you wonderful people, networking, you know, learning loads? It's, I mean, one thing I would ask is if you could put the slides up on some resource somewhere, that would be brilliant. Um, and it comes back to life values. And I think the, the, the role that we can play is to be leaders in the community of helping people rediscover the joy of life to a certain extent, that it isn't getting on a train at six o'clock in the morning with on a cattle truck and or paying 2000 pounds a year, but after half past eight, it's, you know, a hundred pounds a year, you know, so it's giving people choices. And I, and I think it's been a long time. I mean, there is a massive revolution in lifelong learning. There's a massive revolution in, there's an educational revolution coming up where, where kids are not going to be going to university for three, six or nine months of the year. They're going to be dipping in and out. They're going to be working from home and then going a two week residential and coming home again. And I felt that for a long time that, that this whole university education, and yes, it is part of going and being with people and learning, but you don't have to do that for three or five years. Um, I think there's this there's, there's technological revolution. There's a, there's a workplace revolution. There's, there's a, a, a localism revolution, um, the 15 minute city, but growing your own vegetables close to the city. And, and there's, I saw something today about the, 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 the rise of garage businesses where people are turning their garages into coffee shops and local food shops and, and bakeries. Some guy started up a bakery in his garage and he's doing fantastically well. So I think it's a little bit like when they invented the iPhone and they all sat around a table and said, what are we gonna do with it? And they said, well, why don't we just ask the world? And they made it open to anybody to put an app on an iPhone and just let it happen. And I think this is, this is a way of natural evolution, Darwinism, and I think it's a fantastic opportunity. Yeah, I, I think you're right, Bob, I completely agree. Um, <laughs> interestingly, my wife set up a kind of one of Alex's hobby businesses um, last year in the summer over lockdown, which necessitated us taking a storage unit. And it kind of opened our eyes completely to 
the ecosystem that is the big yellow company storage unit and actually how many people run their businesses out of these places. You know, they have an online business and actually, you know, I kind of thought it was just about people whacking their furniture in there because they didn't have enough room for it. But actually, you know, there's, there's loads of people that run their businesses and that's where they're based and they keep their stock there and they sell online and, you know, there'd be kind of a guy getting a delivery of about 50 printers that he was then sell on eBay and would dispatch out from there. Um, and I think you're right. I think, you know, this idea of actually people getting a better feel for their local environments and how they work and, and, and wanting to just have that flexibility. Uh, I think that's probably one of the key takeaways um, for me from, from everything. Um, I'm anxious of time because we did say um, we'd wrap up at half seven. So um, I would just thank all the, the speakers um, for their kind of inputs. Thank everyone for taking part. Um, if you do have to get away, please feel free to go. If you want to hang around and chat a bit longer, you're also very welcome to, to stay on. Um, hopefully you saw the note there. The, the recordings will be made available, so um, you will get a chance to, to see the presentations again.